I wanted to, as Sriman sort of set this up, we're talking about the path of Kriya Yoga. And um, as he said, it's not just technique. And so what I wanted to focus on this morning is the aspect of attunement. And I'd like to start with a little story. There was a sailor who was captured by the enemy during the war, and he was put into prison for 15 years. And at the end of that time, there was a treaty and he was released from prison and he came back to his home shores and a friend gave him an envelope with some money in it to help him get a new start. And as the sailor was walking to his home, he passed a pet store and he went and he looked in the window of the pet store for a long time. And then he went into the pet store and he took all the money that he had and he bought all the caged birds that he could buy. And he took them outside and one by one he opened the doors of the cage and let them fly away. And afterwards someone said to him, how could you spend all the resources you had to free those birds? And he said, after being imprisoned myself, I couldn't stand to watch those birds be imprisoned. And of course, this is not a story about sailors and birds. This is a story about the guru. Because the guru, none of this, none of this imprisonment is uh, put on us by anyone else. But the guru had, has someone who has been imprisoned by his own desires and attachments and long ago freed himself from all of those bonds. And he looks at us and he sees us still imprisoned and he says, I'll do anything to free you. I can't bear to see you still imprisoned. And so the guru comes and he brings teachings and he brings techniques and he brings his own vibration because he is a soul that his found the path that leads to omnipresence. And in finding that path, he creates a pathway for us. And so he says, practice my techniques, my teachings, but follow my pathway. Attune yourself to me. Master used to say, practice the techniques. I can help you through the techniques. That's a potent statement because on the one hand it's saying practice the techniques and it's saying they are the way that you will feel tuned in to the guru. I was very touched by something that Swami said um, in one of his talks. He said that early on his path there was about a year and a half when he hated doing Kriya Yoga. That wasn't the touching part of the story. The touching part of the story <laughs> The touching part of the story was that he did it anyway. And his reason for doing it anyway was he said, I saw no other way out. This was the way that my guru had given me for freedom. What choice did I have? And so he practiced the technique. As Sriman said, not everyone can relate to everything, but you do it anyway. He practiced it, and in the practicing of it, he changed himself. He became in tune with the technique. He became deep, more deeply in tune with his guru. Yogananda used to say, stay in tune with me so I can help you. Again, another potent statement, stay in tune with me so I can help you. Swami told a story once, again, early in his time with Master. And he was in charge of the monks, and lots of men were leaving at that time. Many people were leaving the path. It was a kind of a house cleaning at the end of the life of a guru. And it made him very, very frightened inside himself. Will I leave the path too? Look at that one. He looked so committed, and he's gone. And he was at a satsang with Master, and he was feeling desperate for reassurance. And he looked at Master with this desperation. And he said, Master looked over at him and he smiled encouragingly. But that wasn't enough for Swami. And so he kept desperately praying, but Master, don't let me leave. Master, don't let me leave. And Master never looked at him again that night. And naturally, the way he does, he, he meditates on everything. 
And he realized that in that desperation, he was pushing the guru away. Master smiled at him. He said, it's okay. But he didn't receive it. And by trying to grab it and make it happen, the guru couldn't come in. I'll tell you an example from my own life that's much more trivial. But, but it, it sort of explains it in a, in a good way, which was that I was um, in a store and I was going to buy something. This is how trivial it was. But I wanted to know if Master wanted me to buy it. And so I was just going, well, Master, you know, should I, do, what do you want? What do you want? I want to do the right thing. I want to do the right thing. Should I buy it? Should I not buy it? And, and I'm standing there in the aisle, like doing this whole little thing. And, and then I remembered this thought, stay in tune with me so I can help you. And I realized, how in the world am I going to get an answer? I'm not even remotely on the wavelength of a being of perfect joy, freedom, love, calmness. So I just went, forget it. Just center yourself, feel the presence, and then ask the question. And then the answer was obvious. It, as I say, it was a very small decision, but it was, at least it was a good process of training. Once Swami was asked, what is attunement? And his answer was very simple and very potent. Attunement is harmony. Harmony. So in both of those examples, Swami's example of desperation, my example of angst and confusion, there was an internal harmony. So we couldn't be in tune. And we have to develop, develop that harmony inside ourselves. And how do we do it? Um, I was thinking a couple of weeks ago is when our friend who we've referred to, and I'm so, it's so touching that we've referred to Leela so many times this Spiritual Renewal Week. It's very inspiring to think about that impact because she had such a quiet life, and yet she's had such a big impact. Anyway, a couple of weeks ago at her funeral, Swami talked about how um, how she had lived without a flaw that he could see, and he felt she was free. And so since that time, I've been thinking about that. What, what does that take to be without a flaw? How, how can we get to that place? And we can't, we've had very, very inspiring talks on willpower and magnetism, and we can't get to a flawless place simply by willpower and magnetism and wanting. We can use our willpower to get up and do our kriyas, do our meditation. We can use our willpower to energize daily, to keep the body fit for God realization. But by our willpower, we cannot attune to unconditional love. We can't develop perfect faith by willpower and magnetism. But what we can do, and this is something that Gyandev was talking about yesterday, by putting out our own energy, we lift ourselves so that we can be on the wavelength of the Guru. And if we can do our part to lift our energy, to internalize our energy and lift it, to be on the wavelength of the Guru, that's where perfection can come from. Because the perfection is inside of us already. We don't have to become different than we are. We just have to find that internal attunement that we have with the guru. I had a sort of a fun experience with attunement, and my, my little guru is here today. This happened in the late uh, 70s. We had started having jogathons at Ananda to raise money for various things that continue to the present time. And during this jogathon, we, at that time in our lives, this was early 70s, so we were relatively young. We were running maybe a couple of miles a few times a week. And in a jogathon, you try to run as far as you can. So we didn't actually have a whole heck of a lot of training, but we had a lot of enthusiasm for the whole idea and giving it our all for the cause. And so in this jogathon, I was jogging with Asha, and we were coming up to the five mile mark and we were deciding if we should turn around because that would mean 10 miles, you know, turn around and come back. 
And just at that time, we're kind of just clunking along, carrying on a conversation, not thinking about much of anything. Vidura passes us. And at that time, Vidura was a marathon runner. And he was noted, even among other marathon runners, for the grace. He ran with a, just an incredible ease and grace. And so just as we're going along, this master runner goes past us looking so like he's floating. And so we started to emulate what he was doing. And we were just watching him and we were seeing and feeling and trying to just get what he was doing and it felt wonderful. And so we thought, well, let's just keep going. Let's just pass the, <laughs> the five mile mark and let's just go for another mile. Well, that was a, obviously a dumb mistake. And <laughs> but, we were really having a good time. We were really having a good time for a while. <laughs> um, coming back, you know, and this is the way life is. You get that grace, and then the pain starts. <laughs> and we weren't able to keep our legs moving with that graceful rhythm that we had had for a few a hundred feet or whatever it was. <laughs> but but we did it. And so it happens again and again in life. We get that grace like this week, and then we go back, we hit some of those walls of pain, maybe confusion, maybe stress, maybe tests in our life, and we can't keep it up, but we just come back and we renew and we start over and we keep doing it. Master, I could actually show this to you, you could all read it actually. It's, <laughs> I'm not reading this with glasses, so. <laughs> um, this is a quote from Swami about the guru, and it's so beautiful. Master opened up a particular doorway in the vast ocean of consciousness and said, if you come in here, you'll be able to go deep in God. Master opened up a particular doorway in the ocean of consciousness and said, if you go in here, you'll be able to go deep in God. That's what the guru does. He creates a pathway for us and says, this is the way. And what's interesting now is that science is starting to catch up with this in a very unusual way. There's a lot of um, experiments happening in something called the zero, I think it's called the zero point field. I might have that wrong. And uh, that's right. He, I, he, got, he knows this. I got it right. Um, and there was a woman, a Harvard psychologist, who did this experiment a few years ago. She took a group of men in their 70s, and she took them to a special place that she had created out in the country. And everything in this little village that she had set up was from 1959. Um, all the furniture, the style of houses, there were television sets with TV shows from the 50s on, newspapers from the 50s. I don't know how they can do these sorts of things. But anyway, she had created this world and put these men back into what they had, their life had been like in the 50s. And they were probably, I guess, in their about 20 at that point. And she had done tests on them before she put, took them there and tests on them after that she took them there. And she discovered that signs of aging were reversing. Their arthritis was reducing after a month in this place, or a week, I can't remember how long it was. Their eyesight was improving. And the, the way that the scientists are now saying this is that there's a blueprint within us. And that by tuning into the blueprint of their 20s, their body cooperated with it. Now that's starting to sound a little close to yogic teachings. I don't know if her blueprint is related to karma, but to me, when I hear the idea of blueprint, I think of our soul, I think of the guru, I think of our soul unfolding in its natural direction toward God. And just as Jyotish was talking about on Monday about Frank Laubach, and Bharat was talking about Wednesday, he was talking about get centered and let, uh, uh, get centered and let the universe help you. And Jyotish was talking about Frank Laubach who said, 
I tune into God. And if I stay in tune with God, everything else around me changes. Well, isn't it interesting? It's starting to be proved. If you are interested in going into attunement, I know there are a surprising number of people who actually don't know about the path or the new path. This is Swami Kriyananda's autobiography, and in it he tells about what it was like to live with Yogananda. And so not everyone realizes that after you've read, you know, and some people can't even read the autobiography, it's too much for them. And I always tell them, read this first, then it will all make sense to you. But in this book, there's a chapter on attunement. And uh, some of us were working on helping the publication of this book when Swami was working on it in the 70s. And Asha was his secretary, and she would go there every day to pick up the manuscript because there were no computers, and she would type it up. And she described going to his house when he had just finished the chapter on attunement. And I've always had a visual image of this moment. I imagine Swami coming to the door like he'd been riding in a convertible with the wind <laughs> having blown his hair back. And this exhilaration, because of the way she described it, he was just exhilarated after writing the chapter on attunement because he said, this didn't come out at all what I thought it would be. It just wrote itself. So I've always really tried to tune into that chapter in the book. And interestingly enough, what is that chapter about? It's about negativity. Much of the chapter is about the biggest obstacle to attunement is being negative. And this has been referred to a little bit through the week, but the presence of God and perfection is within us all the time. It's the, very, it's the positive pole at the top of the head, the spiritual eye and the crown chakra. It, it is, we are one with God right now. It's all right there. But we also have the pull at the base of the spine from Kundalini, from Maya, saying, no, you're not one with God, and you're not even interested in being one with God. You don't even care about other people. <laughs> Nothing matters to you but your own self. And it's, it's the pull toward negativity. And when we get negative, even in a righteous, even for anything, in a righteous reason, whatever, unwillingness, grouchiness, not liking another person. We're cooperating with the pull that's taking us away from harmony, taking us away from God. And so we have to pay attention to that, and we have to work with that. And in that chapter, um, there are many parts of the chapter, but one of the most, the book, this book is so incredible on so many levels, but one of the reasons it's incredible is Swami is completely transparent in the way he writes. And so he writes about a time when he was caught in a very small way, but with a negative group of people. And Master got very upset at him because he was probably the only one of that group that stayed on as a disciple and really gave all his attention to Swami and criticizing him and so on. And Swami went to him later and apologized. And Master said, I understand, he said, but what you need is more devotion. So devotion is the way out of those negative states, lifting our energy inward and upward with greater and greater love. And it's something that Swami has taken, obviously, to heart. And now what we've felt this week, and I, I know I speak for all of us, is just so much love from one person, and it's very, very, very important for us. On Monday, Swami talked about tuning into Master and how important it is, and then he said something he rarely says, but he said, he didn't make a big deal about it, but basically he was saying, tune into me also. And I think that what tuning in to him is so important for us is it's easy to get imaginations going in your mind, and you see it throughout religion. It's, religion is noted for all the disharmony and all the people who are saying, well, my guru is the best, and so I'm going to kill you because you aren't following him, and I hate you because you aren't doing it my way. And, um, and people can get going on this, that Yogananda was judgmental or whatever. But when you feel the ray of master that's coming through Swami that is pure 
pure love and the most childlike um, affection for every single person, you go, this has got to be what God's like. I mean, where is this coming from but from God? This has to be a loving path. So this tuning in to that ray when we leave, and it's not so easy to be in our, our little bubble that we have here this week that we're living in and going deep in. Remember and come back and re-immerse re, um, yourself in remembering that love, listening to his talks, reading his books, and just trying to feel that transformative love that we've been feeling this week. Because the path is not just a straight shot up. I think we're all, even those of us who are the newest on the path, have already sort of figured that out. It's not as easy as we thought it might be. My first uh, my first months at Ananda, I was having great meditations. I thought, wow, at this rate, <laughs> and I, I know, you felt, felt it too, at this rate, three years, God realization, I know it, I know it. But it doesn't always work that way. There's a whole other plan. The guru is working on you in a, a profoundly transformational way. It's not about whatever you think it's about, and a lot of times, <laughs> Instead of going up the mountain, you're going down, and you can't even remember where the peak was. But if you're staying with the guru and trying to be in tune, even however miserably you're doing at it, it's still going to work. I have a friend here at Ananda who told me a beautiful dream she'd had. She is a very quiet person, very inward, loves to meditate, and had always led a very quiet life. And then she had a child, and her life got very, very busy, and um, she wasn't meditating very much at all, and she just thought, am I, have I killed my, am I never going to find God? And she had this dream, and in the dream, she was on a bus, and she was taking the bus, she's from Missouri, as, I, as am I, um, she's, she was taking the bus to Jefferson City, which is the capital of Missouri, which to her mind represented freedom. But the bus was going incredibly slowly, incredibly slowly, and was making stop after stop. And she just thought, oh God, I could walk there faster than this. I'm going to get off this bus and walk. I mean, I could jog a little. I'm sure I can beat this bus. So she got off the bus. And instantly, she was lost. She was completely lost. She had no idea where she was. And she just went, oh, I get it. I got to get back on that bus because no matter how slow it goes, I know it's going to get there. And that is our journey, that we have to keep ourselves attuned because the guru knows what, not what will make John or George or Harry free, but what will make us free, each one of us, it will be different, and it won't look like anyone else. So we can't go there. We have to just say, I will trust someone who has found freedom and link myself with them. And I would like to end this morning, my part of this morning, by sharing with you it wasn't given as a visualization, but it's something we can use as a visualization. Sister Gyanamata Mata was Yogananda's most advanced woman disciple, and her byword was attunement to the guru. And after she met Master in Seattle, she didn't get to see him very much for a long time until she moved, was able to move to Mount Washington. But what she did is she would imagine Master wherever he was and she would mentally stand in front of him. Let's just do this now. And I'd like you to use the image that Gyandev gave us yesterday. Well, actually, not all of you can do this. But anyone who's seen the movie of Master, The Incredible Vibrancy, you can use that movie to think of. But use your own favorite image of Master and feel yourself standing in front of him. And as you stand, attune yourself 
to the pure love and goodness flowing from him. Attune yourself to his God consciousness, to the path to God that he has created for us to follow. Use this meditation before you do your Kriya, before you meditate, anytime you can during the day to stand in the presence of the Guru. Oh.